the, the series is sponsored by the um, North University Alumni Relations Office, and we'd like to thank them for their generous support. Um, we also want to thank the Center for Student Success and um, through uh, Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies and Founders College for uh, partnering with us to um, coordinate this afternoon's panel. So um, the purpose of the panel really is um, threefold, to um, provide you with a little bit of inspiration, some um, insight and advice, and an opportunity to connect um, with professionals and uh, um, working in writing and publishing. Um, so before I begin, um, if you haven't already done so, if you could turn off your cell phones and electronic devices so that we could be free of um, disruptions. Um, there is also an attendance sheet at the back, so if you, um, before, if you haven't already signed in, make sure you do so. Um, and if you didn't register, that's okay, just add your name to the list. Um, I would also like to mention that we are videotaping this um, session. Um, and if you do, um, the washrooms are just, uh, ladies are outside the door and gentlemen are outside the store. Um, so we would not be here without, uh, today without our distinguished guests. So let me introduce them to you. Um, so on my immediate left is Adrian Newman, publisher of Lombardi Publishing Corp, also an alumnus. Um, uh, well, all of our panelists are alumnus. Um, next to Adri uh, Adrian is um, Sandy Brass, a freelance writer. Um, Sandy also happens to be the former editor of Oxygen Magazine and former news editor for the Excalibur when she was here. <laughs> um, next to Sandy is um, Eric Tyndale, writer and game designer with Gann Studios Incorporated. And next to Eric is Edward Benner, web communications and publications assistant um, here at York University, Office of the Associate Vice President International, and also a freelance writer and editor. Okay. So um, now the <laughs> panel timeline, um, basically we'll start with, I'll, I'll begin with a few questions, and then, um, and then we'll, a little bit later on, we'll open the, the discussion to questions from the floor. So if any of you have any questions um, for any one of our panelists, feel free to um, raise your hand um, and uh, 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 you know, uh, stand up and we'll, we'll pose your question to the panelists, okay? Um, and about, um, at about quarter to four, we will begin our informal networking mix and mingle. Um, so if you have any, if you're not the type who wants to, uh, to speak on camera or speak in front of a large group and you'd rather um, approach one or more of our panelists um, face to face, then that's an opportunity for you to um, do so and engage in more, uh, more intimate conversation there. Okay, um, and we will be wrapping up um, promptly at 4.30, all right? Okay, so um, to get us started, I would, um, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to um, introduce yourselves to um, the room and tell us briefly about what you're currently doing and how you got to where you are. So if you were to, um, to take yourself back from the point of graduating from York until where you are now, how did you get there? What were some of the, um, steps and pivotal moments in your career history, your career journey that led to where you are now. Um, Adrian, would you like to go first? Okay. So I'm a, uh, <coughs> can everybody hear me by the way? Okay. So I'm Adrian Newman. I'm the publisher at uh, Lombardi Publishing Corporation. We are a financial and health newsletter and book publishing company. Uh, we also uh, publish online information. Uh, I've been with the company since May of 1997 uh, in various roles, starting up as a copywriter and then working my way to publisher right now, where I handle a lot of the new marketing material for uh, the existing products, new product development, as well as handling uh, a lot of the writers, the editors, graphic design. Um, how I got here, I have no idea. <laughs> it seems like yesterday that I, I can't believe I've been in this business for 15 years. Uh, from graduation in which I want to be up front. I was a horrible student. I'm going to be 100% up front with that. Uh, took some time off, graduated, uh, worked in retail, and through uh, some connections that I had made, I was able to land an interview with the job uh, for a copywriter at this company. And subsequently hit it off pretty well there. Had some success and I've been working with that company for 15 years and doing a lot of different things from design to content writing to marketing writing to managing databases 
everything that has to do with the company I've done, uh, and it's just been just been uh, a fantastic journey so far, and I feel like it's still just getting started. Thank you. Thank you. Great. You can all hear me? Great. Uh, my name is Sandy Braz, and I'm a writer. Um, I've done, uh, I've worked for magazines, and I've also done freelance, and most recently I've returned to um, freelance after uh, just a series of um, different projects and different magazines and different periodicals I've worked for, which I, I can get into if you have those types of questions. But as I was driving in, I, I looked around and I'm like, I really don't know this campus anymore because when I graduated, it was nine years ago. <laughs> and um, so I started thinking, you know, on the walk over here about the last nine years and what I could tell you to sort of sum it up. So I'll tell you that my career started at the Excalibur. Is anyone here from the Excal? All right, welcome. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I started my career there, and um, it wasn't really by accident. I wanted to be a writer. I uh, wasn't really sure what that meant or um, how to really get into it. So I saw a sign in a window one day, and it said, The Excalibur, and I went upstairs, and I started writing. And so then I, I moved on to news editor, and I think I was there for three or four years, and it was like a job. Um, I was on staff. We were paid. It was really great. And um, while I was writing there, I started freelancing for Now Magazine and some other periodicals. Um, because the publisher of Now Magazine, Michael Hollett, he, was, he also used to go to Excalibur. If you work there, you probably know that. And he's a York alumni as well. So um, he would come in and do talks. And I was just always blown away by this great career that he had in publishing and writing and you know, kind of being this rogue student journalist when he was here. So I got really hooked into that and then um, kept freelance writing. And when I left uh, school, I went into web. Um, it was sort of getting, <laughs> getting big back then. And uh, I think Strip my jacket. Um, it was getting really big back then. Like people didn't have websites or anything like that. So there was companies that would uh, build websites for ridiculous amounts of money, like twenty thousand bucks for a WordPress site. You know. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, so I was the copywriter. I had a mentor who um, took me under her wing and said, you know, you 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 can write. So why don't you come write for me? And I did. And um, online writing and print are completely different. They continue to be different. Uh, and same thing with publishing, which I can get into for you guys as well. Um, over the last nine years, I've been writing full-time. I've done both corporate writing, um, communications and all that stuff, and PR, which is wonderful, but it's a different kind of writing, which I'm happy to talk to you about as well. Um, a few years ago, I became an editor at Oxygen Magazine. Is anyone familiar with Oxygen Women's Fitness? Yeah, <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> I always tell people um, the women really do look like that in real life. <laughs> yeah, I hate them. So, um, <laughs> no, but it was really good. I was there for a couple years, and then uh, got sw swept away to do some other projects and stuff and you know even though writing is a sort of a tough career you can make money in it um, not necessarily freelancing all the time but taking those corporate gigs are sometimes vital to paying your bills so um, now I'm, I'm freelance writing completely I'm a columnist for a magazine called The Kit uh, which is strictly online so I see a shift in the career again going towards online but um, I'm actually getting back into feature writing for newspapers and magazines because that's what I started doing for the Excalibur, and I'm not doing it because I did it for Excalibur, but it was such a good feeling, and it's like you get this hot feeling in your belly, you know, when you get this really amazing story, and to me, that's what writing is about. So that's what I'm heading back into. Anyway, thank you. Eric. Sure. Uh, I went to York for professional writing, and in third year, I went into the technical stream and picked up a creative writing minor. And uh, in my last year, I got a job as a work-study student here at Atkinson, actually, in the STARS, what was then the STARS office. So I would write promotional materials for them, and that was sort of my first professional writing job. I would do that part-time in the summers. Uh, after graduation, I did a six-month internship at a small Facebook game studio in downtown Toronto called Social Game Universe. And I was their creative writer, and they were making their first game. So that got launched in about January, and then I left in February because there was no sort of employment opportunities there. And in April, I started at GAN Studios. They sort of specialize in kids' games. They are famous for webkins, which is where kids adopt their online pets and play with the toy they bought. And I've been there, it'll be two years in April. So that was fast, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Edward Fenner. I work at the Office of the Associate Vice President International. I am currently a master's student here in the Science and Technology Studies program, so I uh, split my time uh, doing both those functions, but also I'm publisher of uh, Existere Journal of Arts and Literature here at York University. Some of you may have seen it. Our office is in Vanier, 
uh, college and we're always looking for volunteers uh, so that students can get some good experience in publishing. Uh, I got my start in the mid 80s and worked in that industry uh, for about 18 years before I came back to school as a mature student, got my degree also in the professional, prog uh, professional writing program with a minor in science and society. Uh, the reason I took the science part was because I had a technology background. Uh, my writing started in the early days of uh, desktop uh, computers. A lot of publishing was still done in cut and paste mode on actual like paper strips and tape and glue and all that kind of stuff and to be photographed and sent off to press and those kinds of things. So if you want to learn about some of the early days of publishing or early desktop <laughs> publishing, I can talk to you about those things. Uh, but I got my start in uh, my first real job, I guess you could say. I, I had some freelance work uh, doing various kinds of things, but my first real paying full-time permanent gig was as a technical writer. And there's, there's still a growing trade, lots and lots and lots of opportunities there. Um, the more technology you find, the more software that's being developed, there's always somebody behind that writing, either writing the software code, but if you're not a programmer, somebody usually writes the the manuals or the interfaces or the help files or, or database material that goes and feeds it. So there's lots of opportunities there I can talk about as well. I worked as an editor, a senior editor of publications at General Motors Defense for about seven and a half years doing um, uh, everything from mechanical systems to electronics to radios to weapons platforms. So there's a lot of technical stuff there. When the internet came uh, to the fore, that was a, a groundbreaking opportunity. There was money to, money to be made there, some ridiculous money at the start until basically got ruined by very uh, easy ways of getting uh, websites up uh, on your own to the point where it's pretty self-sufficient, or not self-sufficient, but anybody, any mom and pop can do it now. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the early days, nobody knew how to do it, so that's where you have to start recognizing how you can use your skills uh, that you've already worked on as a writer or editor or even as a student working on various publications or just on your essays, saying you have a skill set that you can use in this new domain called the internet. People need websites, they don't know how to write stuff, or they have some basic copy that they have from some other media, and you have to re-massage it into a new format, new media, new audience. So the more skills you can pick up for new kinds of technologies, new kinds of media out there, that'll help you as well. So I can talk to uh, you about any of those kinds of things that you like. Okay. I think we'll stay with Ed for um, the next question, um, and then we'll work our way back to Adrian. Um, so my question is, um, what do you, what specifically do you love about your job, your job, the work that you do, and the, the writing that you do? What do you enjoy most? And what do you find most challenging? Um, what I like the most about, uh, I guess, writing in general is, is that there's always something to write about. Uh, or if you don't have anything to write about, you really aren't expanding your horizons well enough. Uh, when you're a freelance writer, I guess that that activity kicks in a lot. So you're always uh, hounding around looking for the next. Uh, story you can write or or piece of um, copy you can write for somebody's website or their brochures or their marketing material or their technical piece so there's always those kinds of things I always find for me the chat the interesting part was finding the next gig uh, the next mm -hmm. topic the next person to write about because there's always a, a story out there uh, that can be told and there's uh, so many ways you can nuance that story for whatever audience you like um, and that's a skill you have to learn as well because the audiences are very different. Uh, you can use popular magazines or popular media, but there's also a lot of things in the, in the trades and in the corporate sector and government. They all use the same words, but they all have to be re-massaged or repurposed for different ways. And that in, therein is, lies the challenge, is in being able to take the same copy meant for one audience and then re-massage it for another audience and then rework it again for another media. And then you're now you're talking about mobile devices which you're, talk, uh, you're dealing with a different presentation style or attention spans or uh, generations, those kinds of things. So you always have to be aware of who your audience is, and that's, that's to me, a, a huge challenge. Eric? What I like about my job? Yeah. Okay. Um, what do you find most challenging? Well, I guess what I'm most happy about, I was very lucky to find a full-time job that as a game, I write for video games. It's rooted in creativity, but I also get to use my technical writing skills because you have to keep in mind the limitations of the game whenever you're writing. And um, there's technical documents that go along with designing a video game too. But for the most part, I get to be thinking about what I want the characters to be like and what I want them to say in the story and how they're going to interact with the player. So I really enjoy that type of work. I work with a lot of really creative people from artists and other writers and level designers and those type of people. 
Uh, the most challenging part about my job is just because it is a full time and it's not freelance. You really have to write when you don't feel like writing. You have to produce measurable results every week, every day, or people are going to be saying, where is this? The designers made the level and the character doesn't say anything. <laughs> so they don't really accept those kind of excuses. You can't just sit around waiting for inspiration like you can when you're writing your own play or something. Mm -hmm. Um, I definitely <laughs> know that feeling of writing stuff you just don't want to, but um, what I love and what I like and don't like about what I do is the hustle. I love the hustle, um, just like, uh, sorry, your name again? Edward. Edward, I apologize, I was going to say Eric. Um, just like Edward said, you have to kind of go out and find your work, and um, you're networking a lot, and a lot of people are sort of afraid of that word networking, but it's not just what you do kind of giving out business cards. When you're writing, you're on all the time. So the writing, um, a career as a writer, I think is really a lifestyle. And it's it's not Carrie Bradshaw in a fake uh, apartment. That's not the lifestyle that writers lead either. So um, writers can't afford shoes like that. But um, <laughs> yeah, you can, but uh, not most of us. So um, I love the hustle. I, I, I like, that's sort of my personality, you know? That's why corporate didn't work for me forever was because there was a lot of structure to it that um, wasn't for me, but I went back several times to realize that. So that's the thing. Like you're going to make a lot of um, not mistakes. You're just going to make a lot of choices in your writing and/or publishing career. None of them are wrong. You just have to think of them as the next phase to your next really good step. And then what I don't like sometimes is the hustle because there are so many writers today. And what makes a writer? Like you just have to really love the craft and do it. For no other, you would do it whether you were paid or not, you know. Um, better to be paid, always. <laughs> but um, it gets challenging and frustrating when you see how many, like everyone here wants to be a writer, right? So technically you're all competing. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. You know what I mean? You're competing because there's only so many magazines and so many newspapers that you can write for at any given time on any given topic. But um, you got to use that to your advantage. So the hustle, I love and hate it. As a publisher, <coughs> I really like making writers write when they don't want to write. <laughs> <laughs> do you do house calls? Or <laughs> no. Um, in the, uh, the market that I'm in, which is uh, the direct marketing side of the business, uh, because the majority of our newsletters and information is sold through direct marketing, the one thing I love is seeing something that I create myself, I would write or at least oversee, and have it become successful, have it become a product. Uh, just from a simple idea one day when I'm driving into work or when I'm just sitting at home and have a spare moment to myself or whatever. Seeing from the development side of coming up with that idea and then right through to having a subscriber base of 160,000 people. So that's for me the best part of the job. <coughs> the worst part about the job, same thing. When you come up with an idea and everything's going great, and it bombs because mm -hmm. everything is measurable in direct response. I can tell if something that I come up with is going to be successful usually within a four week turnaround. It's deflating, but what I know is that I learn more from the bad stuff than I do from the good stuff. So mm -hmm. take the good with the bad. Okay, thank you. Um, so, sort of uh, to follow up on that, what advice would you give to students, new graduates who are looking at uh, breaking into the Field, getting a paid job as a writer or a publisher, um, um, in terms of you know dealing with the the, the good and the bad, um, or even getting a job. Period. Agent. Well, I think networking right off the bat is the most important thing. It's it, it's so true. It's not what you know. It's it's who you know. And if you know somebody that has uh, that that has a connection, you know, try to get it. Don't be a shill and just you know push them constantly and trying to, uh, you know, give, give me the number of that uh, publisher guy, you know. But always be banging on doors or emailing. Get your stuff out there. Um, I'm constantly looking for new copywriters, new writers. The more stuff that we come up with, the more people we need to produce it. Uh, so never be afraid of self-promotion. Um, like uh, Edward said, it's so easy to get any mom and pop out of a website now. Take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. You know, feel free to do that. Um, you know, and and also don't get 
to uh, to uh, to down. You know, uh, it takes a lot of work. Like like I said, my my industry, the majority of the stuff that I come up with, bombs. But it's the successful ones that really hit really hit the home run, and that's what. Uh, that's what I always take from it is that I can always, like I said, learn more from my failures than I can from my successes and then take that to the next step. Thank you. Um, was it what advice we'd yeah. give? Uh, I could say a lot of things, but I'll tell you from sort of like an action perspective, like if you were to leave here today, what you could start working on. Um, start writing a blog if you don't already. Um, it's very important to be found online using search. It's not just about, you know, being emo and writing a post about your feelings. Those are wonderful things. But um, I do get projects from blogs because people will look for, I, I'm also a fitness journalist because I worked for Oxygen for so long. That gave me a lot of clout, you know. So when people are looking for fitness journalists Toronto, I come up, which is really great. So I end up getting um, quite a bit of work. So I'd say start a blog, um, build a website, even if you don't have a lot to say. I did my first website when I left university. Um, I had a friend who knew how to build them, um, so <laughs> which was really a big deal, but now you can do it. And then the other thing I would say is um, start thinking like a writer, whatever that means for you. So start telling people in your life that you're a writer. Don't be shy. I didn't call myself a writer for a long time. I felt that was some sort of name I didn't deserve for some reason, you know. But um, I was just really shy about it. Um, but start telling people wh what you do. Hey, I'm a writer. I'm an editor. I'm a reporter. I'm looking for this. And converse with people. Networking isn't just pimping out your business card, you know, it's, it's building those relationships. Um, so whether you're, you know, you meet someone here today or whatever, let them know that you're interested in being a writer. Um, you know, Edward said that he's looking for volunteers. That's a really good place to start your portfolio, so. Well, I think university is filled with opportunities to learn to write when you don't want to write because there are <laughs> lots of assignments that I remember having no interest in doing. Okay, yeah, and bad editors. Yeah. <laughs> so, but in first year, they really instilled that in me that just set a goal for the day, have a section or a word count you want to hit, and even if it's not your best work, go back and fix it the next day. Mm -hmm. And make sure you do go back and fix it the next day because you should get used to polishing. I was in my writing classes, there'd be a lot of excellent work that had just glaring mistakes and it really overshadowed the rest of the story. So if you're at work and there's a typo, that really reflects badly on you because you're supposed to be the authority yeah. on the writing. Um, I think uh, through my career, and at least uh, also with a lot of peers I've had over the years and colleagues, uh, one of the things that really comes to the fore is a can-do attitude. Uh, <coughs> basically, if somebody says, can you do this, you say, yes, I can. It's, it's a lot like the acting profession when some, you know, you're up for a casting call and you're saying, can you play this? Before, almost before they can finish the sentence, say, yes, I can, of course I mm -hmm. can. Uh, you really have to push yourself, and, and particularly when you don't have experience, you have to try uh, something new and it's a little bit scary but you do have to try those new things because you never know where your first break is going to come uh, it might be a small job it might only be a hundred dollars but it's an actual writing assignment that somebody's going to pay you money for that goes in your portfolio then you get another one maybe it's a volunteer one you're doing for uh, your local religious institution or a chamber of commerce something small or something for a local business or even a family member but if it's for their business and actually going out there on their website or something then that goes in your portfolio. You slowly build them up. And if you have a website, uh, get their permissions to try and post them. If you think they're good enough to post, then that becomes your online portfolio. But do remember to get your permissions. There's a lot of rules about copyright. Get to know the copyright laws. So make sure you're not uh, getting yourself in trouble uh, because some people don't want their stuff published. And, and keep editing that as you go along so that your better work supersedes your older work. And keep your CV up to date as well. Uh, uh, like Sandy said, it, it's also it's very easy to uh, create a website, so make sure you do do that. Like when I had to start doing websites, learning HTML coding and all that kind of stuff by hand, I still do a lot of that manually just because I can. But with the uh, rise of WordPress, uh, anyone here can can learn it very very quickly and maintain their website. It does not have to be fancy or elaborate. It's something very simple and basic. Just look at what's out there and emulate what they've got. Uh, Use some samples of your best writing from school. If you have a poem or a short story or an article or a chunk of an essay, if that's all you have at the moment to try and sell yourself to someone, then by all means use it. I mean, don't take the one with all the marks on it. Just take a nice clean bit or just use sample quotes from something that got, a, uh, got you good support. So, so do build that sort of arsenal of material 
uh, references and things like that. That'll help you uh, get yourself through the gate early, get, get through the gate to, to start you on your career. Thank you. Um, I think at this point we can begin to take questions from the floor. Does anyone have a question for one or all of our panelists? We have all the answers. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yeah. Do you have any dying, urgent questions? Yes. No, right there. In print, right. yeah. What the difference is? I'm sure. I'm just going to repeat the question sure. uh, for the camera. Um, so the question was about um, uh, the difference between um, online writing and, and print writing. Right. Um, online writing and print writing, um, there's so many nuances, but from just a length perspective, you're going to be able to, there's some, there's some debate on it. So let's say I have an article I'm writing in the Excalibur, you know, and there, my limit is 500 words. I can continue that article or have an expansion online, which is going to give me a lot more ability to talk and engage. You know, people can comment and people can, it's just incredible how far as a writer your work can actually reach. The thing is with online writing is that, like I'm a columnist for the, um, for the kit, which is a beauty magazine, and it's all just quick stuff. And my word count is 250 words. It's frustrating because you want to say more, and I think sometimes print is a little bit more, this is just my opinion, I still feel that print is a little bit more ele elevated than online in, in the sense that you're going to get uh, more focused type professional writing in print, usually, <laughs> depending on what paper you read. Um, and then online, you're gonna get all sorts of stuff, you know? So that's changed even more than when I first started writing online. But the main thing was length, how quippy and quick it was. And there just didn't, it didn't seem as difficult. But I felt like when I was writing online full time, the output was just so much more intense. Like you constantly needed to bring up new stuff because it's online and you have to stay really fresh. Does that make sense? So it's, it's really good if you're, um, not that if you write online you can't write in print. I say do both. But try, they're, they're not the same animal. That's, that's what I would say. Anyone else like to comment on that? When I, uh, when I ask writers to write for online, there's, uh, an, fortunately, unfortunately, we are always looking to get traffic to the website based mm -hmm. on the, the content. And uh, what I've encountered is that I have to tell some writers, or this is probably going back a couple of years now, uh, about keyword density for search engine optimization, if anybody's familiar with that. Uh, so that is also part of the game, is when they're writing the articles for, for the site, the sites that we have, there has to be a certain amount of keyword density from the specific keywords that we are looking for the search engines to, to crawl for our website. Usually it's around uh, 2 to 3 percent of the article has to be heavy on a specific keyword. So for example, if we have uh, an article on homeopathy, homeopathy has to be mentioned in that article 2 to 3 percent of the time, uh, plus depending on something else. So there's other, um, sorry, the other keywords that are involved with that. So that's sort of an obstacle, I would say, for some for some writers. It's uh, there's money there, though. With there, well, that's writing. as a and, and as a as a publisher, I'm always you know looking for more traffic to the website so I could sell more subscriptions to the paid newsletters, uh, and that's what I'm always looking for from the from the writers. And that's really the big difference for me with uh, online versus uh, print. I just want to add one, um, if I may, mm -hmm. just to the, um, thank you. I just want to add one quick thing to the, um, to the SEO, to the search engine optimization. I've gotten, you're all familiar with that, right? Yeah, like nine years mm -hmm. ago, nobody knew what that was. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I also uh, blog professionally for large brands for a creative agency, so I guess creative copywriter. And there's a lot of work in that if that's the kind of writing that you're into. So you'll have an editor who probably has less experience than you editing your stuff, but you just deal with it. You'll get a topic, and not mm -hmm. say you, <laughs> but my editor, yes. And, um, but they're really great at giving you sort of what to talk about and giving you a lot of focus. So when you're writing online, it's like, all right, great. I get to use the word homeopathy six yeah. times, and then that's your core. It's your focus. And then you get to create really great language around that. There's a lot of money in that for writers if you like that kind of writing. Um, I'm sure you're aware, as everyone else is here, that uh, social networking um, has be or, you know, social networking platforms have become kind of a big thing in uh, technical writing and uh, communications and so on. 
as well as freelance writing, etc. And um, for someone, I guess, like me, where I kind of I have a disdain for that, for Facebook, for Twitter, for Tumblr, partially because I don't think I have much to say to be saying it every minute of every day. Also because if I was to engage it on its own terms, I wouldn't be very marketable. Um, how important is it to maintain a social media presence, even if it's benign or asinine? Mm -hmm. and, um, <laughs> it's all asinine. Media, think, um, <laughs> and also, um, how, how easy it is, because I'm not like net illiterate. I know how to use Twitter, I just elect not to. I know what search engine optimization is and so on. Um, how do I have to maintain that benign, asinine media presence in order to prove that I have those skills? Yes. That's a big question, but yeah. Mm -hmm. How important is it to have uh, social media presence uh, as a budding young writer? Yeah, yeah, in a pragmatic sense. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Who wants to start? Ed? Um, I would say at the very least you should monitor it because if it's if it's commonplace a lot of industries like York University is heavy into social media as well part of my job is to monitor social media and uh, and uh, manage it for for our office but I also sit on the strategic communication council at York which uh, develops policy and strategy for all communications uh, at the university and, and we do talk a lot about social media the social media protocols what to do what not to do um, and one of the things that's come up recently is um, uh, Pinterest, whether uh, staffers should or, or departments should engage in Pinterest, for example, because that's starting to become the new, mm -hmm. the new Facebook or the new Twitter. It's, it's, very, uh, it's become very popular and, and much more, uh, high, I wouldn't say high profile, but conspicuous, let's say. So now the question's come up whether we should be engaging in this or not. Right now we're holding back mostly because we're concerned about things like copyright. And in the Toronto Star today, there was uh, an, an interesting article about uh, copyright. Part of Pinterest is to post photographs and, and things of interest and pin it on this bulletin board. Well, that's raising legal issues as to whether or not um, people should be doing that or whether they're subject to, to potential lawsuits. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why we keep an eye on those kinds of things. And as an individual, if I was a young writer again, starting fresh now, I would certainly be uh, have a, a very basic presence on certain things like Facebook or, or if you don't have a Twitter account, at least monitor a few that are in the subject area. Like there's a lot, every publisher's got one. Every, every publisher's got a Facebook page. If you want to get to know the business and get to know what's going on in the business, get to know what their social outlets are so that you can keep an eye on what's going on. So you can talk intelligently to your peers or at an interview you don't want to be coming in completely uh, unawares of what's going on. They said, well, did you notice what, what we're doing on Facebook with this campaign? And you don't want to be going, uh, no, I didn't really look at it at all. I had no idea you had one. It's not necessarily that they're going to be looking at your account, which they might if you're going for a job or so, or they want to see uh, if, you're engaged, if you want to go for a job within these companies, and it might be in the social media angle of it. So you better have some skills that can uh, address that as well. And if you are going to keep account, an account, whether it's a Facebook account or Twitter or something else, keep it neat, clean, and professional. I mean, it doesn't say you can't have fun with it, but keep, an eye, uh, keep in mind that your future employer might be keeping an uh, eye on you as well. Uh, and that might uh, sabotage or help your uh, interview as you go along. So just keep that in mind as well. Anyone else like to comment? Yeah, um, sorry, go ahead. Um, I've had um, some freelance work in um, social media, especially in the last couple of years. There's been a big call for uh, community managers. Have you guys heard of this new job? It's like a, it's a brand new role in the <coughs> last maybe 24 months to come out. And I was mentoring a young girl who was a community manager, and her whole job is to, for the company I was doing um, writing for, their, it was to manage their Facebook and Twitter account and YouTube account. That sounds like a dream job, but it's not. Um, in the sense that it's still a responsibility. You have to really be careful with the way that you're managing your social media. So Facebook, if you're going to use Facebook, use it socially maybe, you know. Twitter, I think, is a really good um, networking tool. It's, it's irritating because people do tweet all sorts of things. Just don't follow them. But who you're going to want to follow are editors. Huge. I follow Margaret Atwood. She tweets repeatedly all day long. Does she say anything really substantial? It depends. You know, at least she has contact with her readers now. So there's there's a really, you can go also create your own audience. And when you're looking to self-publish a book, for instance, um, 
publishers are wonderful, um, but a lot of people want to self-publish. Uh, you got to build your audience, right? How are they going to connect with you? And it's through social media. So for all the negatives there is to social media, there's a lot of positives. You don't have to be on there if it's not going to work for you and if you're not going to upkeep it. There's nothing worse than, in my opinion, you know, seeing a really great budding young writer, you go to their website or their blog or their Twitter page, and it's dead. What's the point? Where's the conversation? So if you're not going to use the outlet, don't start it. That's just my opinion. Yeah, I would say I'm wrestling with a lot of the same issues you brought <laughs> up about social media. But to not know about it, it, like you said, is probably a lost opportunity because yeah. there are community managers now in most companies. So And you get work from it. You yeah. really do. People mm -hmm. will search for you, fitness journalism again, or whatever it is your specialty. The things that you tweet about, I don't even know the scope of how it all works, but it does work. I promise you, my Twitter account is worth money to me now because of it. So. But yeah, that, it doesn't always happen that way. It's almost the same as when you guys were talking about the website starting and people yeah. claiming to be professionals. There's a lot of people claiming to be social media pr experts right now. Yeah, being and on Twitter all day yeah. doesn't make you an expert. Mm -hmm. It makes you bored, I think. <laughs> yeah. But right now, if there's money to be made by saying you are one and maybe your older boss doesn't understand it, then you could have that job for a while and then <laughs> break into something else when you're ready. But remember what kind of writing that is, right? So it's, it, you don't have to decide what kind of writer you want to be. That changes all the time. That's changed for me a bunch of times. But um, if you don't, if you're not into writing, you know, 140 characters for your boss, then maybe that's not the job for you. But it's an option because if you can put together a beautiful sentence for Twitter, then they might hire you because there's a lot of people doing it poorly. So that goes back to the challenges too, though that we were talking about earlier. Sometimes it is a matter of new opportunities that come up with new technologies, and I didn't, I wasn't too aware of, of community managers, but I guess in some ways I'm a community manager for, for at least the department I'm in. That was a, when I started that job nearly four years ago, that didn't exist. We didn't mm -hmm. have a Facebook account, a Twitter account. It wasn't even part of my job description. I was handling the website, a few publications, and a few other things here and there. Then Facebook became a presence, then Twitter became a presence, and uh, Flickr accounts had to be managed, so I mean, they all became part of my tool bag uh, as a writer and editor and communicator and a publisher. So the more tools you can have in your kit that you can use, it provides more opportunities uh, that you can secure a job or a contract, whether it's short-term, incidental, or permanent one. I'm not sure how LinkedIn fits with this, but I, I tend to use it quite a bit because I like to look at, you know, when I look for a writer, I like to see who they've done work for before it, you know, chances are good that I can see, uh, you know, their, their website on their LinkedIn page. Uh, you know, it's not as social. I don't get to see, you know, pictures of their feet or the food they ate or their cats <laughs> or anything like that. But, you know, I can, I can at the very least see, you know, who they have a connection with and then contact people in my network and say, hey, have you used this writer before? And they can give me feedback on it. And chances are if they're on their LinkedIn network, they, uh, they usually give me uh, some pretty good feedback. And I found actually a few copywriters through LinkedIn uh, by contacting my competitors, so. Okay. Yes. I would like to ask you about publisher for mother. Like the, if we want to publishing the bucket book, how, the, what the land would be like a fine cafe, tune cafe, bucket book, like a small one for bucket, I mean. So, so, sorry, you want to find out the... The, the publishing uh, pocket book. So if you're interested in publishing a yeah. pocket book, book mm -hmm. how many pages we design as a pocket book? Pages. What's the We've never done uh, those kind of pocketbooks before. Uh, from what uh, from what I understand, like you could probably get away with even just a small fifty-page book. Yeah. Why not? You know, there's so many different uh, ways of, of publishing it. There, if uh, you're talking about the perfect bound yeah. books, we've done stuff as small as uh, twenty-four pages. So, but next, uh, my next question is: uh, Publisher, would you interested to publishing if that's valuable? The bucket book, you book, you pick this anyway to do publishing of it. The majority of the stuff that I publish is stuff that we come up with ourselves. But we've had people and and writers come up to us and say, "Can you publish our book our book for us mm -hmm. and market it?" And we have done it successfully before. So, yeah, I've done I've done that before. So how much cost us in the beginning initially? It, dep it depends on on uh, on the book, on the page count. Fifty page, hundred page. So maybe that's something mm -hmm. you can discuss later on. Oh, I see. Yeah, I don't, I don't give you a price right now. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Um, I don't know, maybe the four of you can answer this. Uh, Mitchell, I can address it. Um, but 
I've actually done a website, and I do uh, write some articles on my website. It has a lot of following. Um, somebody actually said, you know, are you like giving out all this information for free? Mm -hmm. And I was like, yes. Because, <laughs> I mean, I just feel that, you know, I'm just giving out information. They, I don't know how to make it maybe pay out for me, but I was just doing this, you know, for the sake of just giving out On a website? Yeah. On your own website? Yeah, on my own website. And um, another, so, I don't know, do I need to get an editor? No, I so your question is, you're writing just purely out of interest and passion for writing, mm -hmm. and you're doing it online, mm -hmm. um, and you're wondering if you, if you can translate that in any way to in, into a money-making kind of opportunity, or if you need um, a team to represent you or something like that, like an editor or an agent yeah, or like whatever. Would I need an editor for you know, what I'm writing? And then well, an editor is going to cost you money, not make you money. So <laughs> you don't want to hire an editor necessarily. But um, if you're trying to make money from your website, that's a really tough question. I mean, it's possible. Um, we can chat afterwards if you like. I do have some maybe websites you can go to to, to look at that. But how do you don't, uh, unfortunately, just publishing to online, you're not going to see any revenue necessarily unless you're using something like AdWords and you have a lot of traffic and but if you say you have a lot of fo followers and maybe we can talk about how to leverage because you should be leveraging your audience like anyone in here if you have an audience on, on any you should be leveraging your audience when you can that's it I <laughs> just need 20 million yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and maybe the second part of my question was I'm you know looking at publishing or writing a book Um, so I wanted to find out, you know, would I approach, you know, how, how would I approach a publisher? Would I give you, like, say, my script and say, this is what I want to publish for when the book is finished, my, like, my kind of rough copy? Okay. So you, you want, you're hoping that Adriana or maybe the others mm -hmm. can enlighten you into, uh, with regard to the process of getting published. Right. Um, so if you are um, planning on putting together, uh, like putting out a book, of your own, um, how do you go from the concept idea to getting published? Yeah. Okay. And that's it, it's you can go directly to a publisher. I don't know how successful it would be to go directly to a publisher. I've had I've had writers come directly to me, and like I said, I've, we've done stuff with them before. Um, having a, a, a the very least, you know, some kind of manuscript, uh, basic idea, and, and what your goal is for the for that book. Uh, are you just planning on just getting it printed and, and distributing it yourself? Do you want it distributed? Do you want it like a full book deal? You know, what's, what's your end, end goal? Uh, some people, they just like to have their stuff in print. We had a doctor once who, who wanted a, a small book printed just to get out to patients in his, uh, in his practice. Uh, but if you wanted to go further on that, I don't know, I think you probably need uh, some sort of literary agent maybe to help you out yeah. with, with that. Yeah, I can comment on that. I'm working on two books right now, one on mature students and uh, one on a, a biography of a physicist. And the process, uh, at least for me, one is, is academic and the other is much more, I guess you could say, popular, popular media or popular audience. Uh, the processes are more or less the same. You do have to have not a full manuscript, but you have to at least have a, um, uh, like a table of contents developed as to what you're, what you're going to be talking about. And it has to be pretty tight and what you want to do. Uh, two or three sample chapters, well-written, edited, finished product, uh, a query letter, and you have to send, start sending that to agencies. Not so much publishers. Some of the small mm -hmm. presses might take them direct, but you have to go to their website and investigate what their requirements are. And there is a lot of legwork involved. You do have to do a lot of investigation to see what the requirements are, but usually you do have to find an agent first. And there's a lot of agencies right here in Toronto that you can at least start with Start the lines of communication, start talking to them, uh, start pushing your envelope, and communication is key because you have to start, if you want to communicate through a book, you have to be able to communicate through email and telephone and in person as well. You have to start going outside your comfort zone and learn how to speak publicly. If you're not used to speaking publicly, you have to start learning to speak publicly. Uh, take a course, that's one of the best courses I took as an undergrad, was public speaking. It allowed me to overcome nervousness, develop uh, uh, speaking skills on the fly, uh, changing topics on the fly, that kind of thing, because 
if you're at an event like this or in a networking environment or you're at, uh, say, Harborfront book, um, author uh, event or something like that or some other publishing event or activity or book reading, those are opportunities to start doing that networking thing again. And you have to be able to talk to them comfortably and about what it is that you're passionate about because you have to translate that passion to the publisher or agent so that they get jazzed by what it is you're writing and want to know more and see a sample of, your, of what it is you're after. Because if you can't bridge that, it's going to be much more difficult to do it remotely because of your, part of your personality uh, goes into it when, when you're actually talking to someone. And it, it does take work to, to develop that as well. But uh, being in an environment talking like this now, uh, just asking questions is a good way to start because it is often a very nervous experience just to talk amongst people you don't know. So it's a good start. Lots of questions now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question is for the whole panel. Um, you know, were there any volunteer positions that really helped you on your career path? Besides working in like a newspaper or something, anything kind of random that you didn't think would help, but then in the end it really turned out to help. Great question. So your your question is about experience. Yes. So mm -hmm. volunteering primarily, yeah, or volunteer. Just, okay. So volunteer experience that you've had that helped you propel your career. I gotta think about that one. Okay. Um, I taught yoga for many years. Um, I actually used to teach at York, uh, which is to, like you know for tuition and stuff. Um, so if anyone teaches fitness here, I recommend going to the fitness center and telling them that you teach because they pay pretty good. Um, yeah, I taught yoga. Um, it wasn't volunteer. I did do some volunteer stuff. I started a charity called Yoga in Motion, um, which raised a lot of money for breast cancer after I finished school. But I found that teaching in front of like a large group um, was really helpful for just getting comfortable and talking to people because when you're writing, you need to, you need to be as good of a talker as you are um, a writer because you need to pull stuff out of people and make them you know, like you and trust you and give you what you need to know. And <laughs> but um, yeah, yoga really helped me. Well, I'd consider my first internship volunteer because they weren't paying me. So um, <laughs> well, I was 22 and I thought I, this is my, probably my only chance to work for free. And I saw the posting for oh, Creative no, Writer. No, no. <laughs> that was the only time I was interested in working for free. And um, <laughs> so there was a lot of technical writing jobs that I saw posted, and I had a couple of interviews lined up to write instruction manuals and things like that, and I wasn't ready to resign myself to that. So I did the six-month internship, and that experience led directly to my current job because it, um, the game experience set me apart from creative writers who just sort of specialize in stories and things like that. Yeah, it was called Social Game Universe, and uh, they're still downtown. They're at uh, Queen and Spadina. I think one of the first volunteering experiences I can recollect doing was, was volunteering with some of the family businesses that were around in, in our town. A lot of them ha uh, were um, uh, done by folks who did not have high school education, so there's some spelling issues and some of their... Um, uh, things like menus or things that they would sign signage that they would put on the street or uh, little booklets that they had to produce or flyers even. So, I mean, that's that was great. just one way I got started. I was a teenager. That's so great. Uh, basically, you know, I would. You don't tell them that. Oh, you know, your stuff is crap. It's terrible. You're embarrassing yourself. But you do want to kind of, in a, in a much more subtle and polite way, saying, uh, "I could help you fix it. Let me rewrite this for you." And. Uh, you know, usually it was it was a good experience because they said, "Yeah, by all means, you know, can you help me fix it?" Because they knew that they weren't, uh, it wasn't doing what they needed, or that it was perhaps doing what they didn't want, which is turning people off. Spelling mistakes in in your advertisement or your copy it really turns a lot of people off because it, it lends to competency issues mm -hmm. as to whether you're actually articulating what it is you're doing or whether you're capable of doing what it is you're trying to sell or provide. It doesn't matter if you're making a widget if the booklet that goes with it is 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 useless junk or misspelled or, or misdirects on how to use the widget, uh, that's a bad thing. So if you can get your start just you know helping a few little places, that helps start your portfolio because you can not only rewrite it, you can redesign it, make it look really cool. And if it only takes you an hour or two of your time, uh, that's no big deal and you've got uh, something you can show somebody else for an actual paying job. Uh, where the volunteering for me now is, is, or at least through my career, is Sometimes when you're getting a paid job, you volunteer to do something else that you notice on the job that needs doing, and it might only take a couple hours' work as well. 
and you don't charge them for that because they're, you're already being, especially on a freelance job. So oh, I just threw that in. I noticed that was, you know, you might want to get that done. Or I noticed on your uh, in, your about us page, I wasn't doing the website, but I noticed on your your about us page, you have three spelling mistakes. Mm -hmm. Here's the new text. You just throw it in as attachment, and you said no charge. Here you go, and that's that's cool. And that way, you can just link back saying, "Hey, the about us page has been updated by me." Yeah. I mean, if you don't have a lot of material, that's what you do. If you have a lot yeah. of material, you don't worry about that. But that's one way of also building trust issues to help your client look as good as they possibly can. And one of the things I do now is, like I said, <coughs> I volunteer by uh, with uh, the journal Eggs of Stairs. So I provide part of my uh, giving back to the art community is providing opportunities for students to gain experience uh, through volunteering at a publication. So uh, we're going through a new round of looking for students for the, for the summer to produce the issue in the fall, and that's basically starting now. So I have cards here afterwards when we, when we do our one-on-ones. You can, you can chat with me and pick up a card, and we can talk about doing some volunteering for the journal. If it's something you're dedicating a lot of time to, like you're in an office every day, don't be afraid to cut it short either. If after a month you realize you're not writing or you're not doing what they said you'd be doing and you're not getting anything out of it, you should go because That's there are smart. people who will take advantage of you. There's a lot of internships out there. So if you're not getting the mutual benefit, just give them your letter and take off. <laughs> As a, as a publisher, like I, I, I think just always, always networking. That's my number one piece of advice. Just always find, you know, people out there that, that are going to help you down the road. Um, uh, we don't. It's funny because like you guys talk about internships and everything like that. We've never. We've hired so many writers. We've never used yeah. interns. Um, we're always. We, we always pay for my writing, and I'm thinking, well. I could have gotten it for free all this time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. But uh, no, I, I think focusing on the networking is it, it, it's an important part. But that's as a as a publisher. So I, I have something to say on the on the time because I remember I'm um, going through the same thing, and I worked at Excalibur like full time and went to school full time. So it's it's doable. Um, and n not to say that school isn't super important because it is. But uh, what um, program are you in? not a writing program. The reason I asked was because I was in English and Communications and I found that because there was just so much writing, I would just take a break from an essay and do something else. Also having a job at the, I can't stress enough how everybody should really be writing for your university paper. I'm serious. Um, whatever university that is, but the Excalibur is really great. Um, it's a good place to start and um, they had offices and stuff. You could hang out and then like work on your stuff and then work on your essays. But um, on the free thing, be careful. Now, I'd say it's really good, but if you're really intending to make a career at writing, don't devalue yourself before you're even out of the gate, you know? Um, it's fine to do a free thing here and there if the payoff is good enough. I still do stuff um, that I don't always charge for because I know that it's either a really brilliant editor that's going to look at my work or whatever the project is that. It's very rare, but you have to pay your bills, right? So um, it's great that you're doing online, but don't be afraid to say, you know what, I'd really like 50 bucks for my time. This is, this is what I charge. You're going to not always get what you need, or, or, so you're, you're not always going to get that job necessarily, but there will be somebody who's willing to treat you like a professional if you're willing to treat your own career from a, does that make sense? So careful, especially with the online, the blogs and stuff, and you can write for us and whatever. You know, if you really want to make a, a career of it, then treat yourself like a professional first. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
I would say write no more than a few freebies out there. I yeah. I did the odd one for a company that started up who promised to keep it within his within his website and that's where it would stay for his business and that was fine. But then I found when I searched some key phrases within that article, it popped up on about 50 different sites. People and I steal. never got paid for it. So yeah, people steal all the time uh, online. People steal. Yeah, so that that wasn't cool, but but uh, fortunately, as a professional writer, you write good material. It it, it still sticks around because it's still representing you. You don't want to do a shabby piece, even if it's for free, because like it may show up in twenty, thirty, fifty, two hundred different places. With fortunately, my name is usually still on it, and not someone else's. I've not seen anyone else's name stuck on it, so they're. Whoever's been ripping it off is very careful to not do that because that can cause other kinds of problems. But at the same time, there is there are a lot of uh, social media type sites out there which claim to which which fish for young writers like yourselves, particularly universities and colleges, saying write for us for free. We promise we'll pay you later. Uh, you know, after a few articles, I wrote a few for them. They kept promising and delaying and humming and hawing. And I said forget it. You know, they're still posted and they're they're making money, but they didn't pay me. So I would say stay away from those kinds of mm -hmm. sites. It certainly don't write lots and lots of material for them. You'll um, know when you're getting ripped off. You can feel it. It's yeah. not like you're doing it as a, as, a, as a stepping stone. You'll just be like, wait a second. This person is completely punking me. You know, yeah. that's the thing. It's, it's creative. Um, it's intellectual property, right? It's not a thing you can hold and it has a value. It's in your head. It's your ideas. It's your writing. So you need to, um, again, put a value on that before anyone else does because it starts right away, you know. No comments to the end, yes. Um, I had a question because it was this kind of question on the, the idea of the social media and devaluing yourself by doing a lot of writing. I've already done a lot of writing for a couple of student like papers. Um, not like the university ones, but like the um, not the Excalibur. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately not. Um, but I like, don't know what it's like today. It was great nine years ago. So, uh, well, it I'm looks sorry, good. I'm actually considering like doing more of that. But at the same time like I'm, I'm also considering because I did a lot of stuff when I was younger and I just kind of put up like random stuff on the internet yeah. and I've gone back and tracked like a lot of stuff and a lot of things I was smart enough to just put a student in because I knew it was pretty bad. Um, <laughs> um, and then uh, there's, there's also just stuff that I was just kind of just like throwing ideas that were kind of like, mm -hmm. like sound like a good idea when you put it up but it's kind of radical and you're like, oh that's kind of nonsense and that's kind of offensive now that I know a little bit better. Um, and then I, I've gone through a lot of my, I, I, I luckily a lot, a lot on personal blogs I took it all down. Why? There's also stuff on like you know your social media uh -huh. and Twitter, like say supporting something like Occupy uh, Wall Street uh, when it was still kind of like unformed, which is kind of radical at that time, but right. kind of mainstream now. There's a lot of other movements that never kind of made it mainstream. Um, and and one of the papers I wrote for, I did a lot of editing and stuff, and I'm there's an editing job I'm applying for, oh. and and I realized like obviously it was a political paper, and I'm just like um, how to like like not having like password your like you know like I've, I've obviously matured from what I said previously but like still I some of the work I did was really like good quality like every now and then like mm -hmm. editing wise and I, I want to actually show that off but at the same time distancing myself from the idea of hey like mm -hmm. not everything I say here I realize is kind of like silly now but at the same time like like I want to get into fiction because I just a lot of analytical critical work yeah how much would that affect my like a portfolio like that it was all over the place I wasn't planning to write or something but I just kind of Nobody it. plans it because I mean nobody plans. Well, no, exactly I'm just joking. Right. People so plan. Like, no, you plan. How do you kind of like manage that and still like rely on a pretty like something like really good work that I've done and like copywriting? Um, so your question is about how do you ensure that your past any work that you've um, done, uh, any writing that you've done in the past doesn't haunt you or uh, hurt you yeah. moving forward? Okay. I guess the question I've got is. Even though you think it's silly, you know, what you've done in the past, or you, you don't agree with it, or, or what have you, do you still find it good writing? It, it, that, that's exactly what it is. It's like really good writing. Like mm -hmm. One of these papers, um, all my stuff, some really good stuff that I put up. Right. Um, I might not agree with everything of it, like what I said previously. It's like four years ago. But it was actually some really, like, quality writing was actually really good. So, it, so I don't think there's any problem with having that there. Because really what you're, you're doing is you're not typecasting yourself. You, you can, it, it, it's like Edward said earlier, you know, the yes I can, you know, you know, can you write for this? Yes I can. Look, I wrote, I wrote this, even though, you know, really I didn't have kind of any belief in it or, or what have you. Uh, I just did a lot of research and I was able to, to convey that on, on paper. Uh, I don't think you should be, you know, unless it's like, 
truly offensive. Uh, and, you yeah, know, like libelous or something. Yeah, libelous. Sure now, but like, but you know, if I if I'm looking for a writer and I and, and they show me that you know, I find that kind of thing online, you know, I, I I would just chalk it up sometimes. You know, if that was from ten years ago or five years ago, you know, I, I look at sort of the product of the writing as opposed to what you know sort of the silliness or the theme of it anyway, you know what I'm saying? That's your evolution too, as a writer. You know, as long as, I mean, if you're, if there's excessive swearing, I'm all for swearing, like I swear a lot. It's taking a lot out of me not to swear up here. But um, <laughs> the point is that uh, don't be ashamed of what you've put up. If it's not really vulgar or libelous or slandering somebody, keep it up there and I'll tell you why. Because I go through this all the time, you know, like I write professionally and I still have self-doubt every day. Um, that's just a, I think, a writer thing. People who just spend time in their heads a lot with a lot of ideas, you know, your medium is just to dump it, whether it's like a, on a blog or a book or a newsletter or whatever. That's just your medium. But the point is that you're a thinker, so your stuff is going to be out there. So what, you know, a, a publisher like Adrian might see is a progression of a person from a university student to five years from now a really professional writer. That stuff gets buried the more that you um, you know, publish and stuff and write. Like, some of the stuff I wrote early on is so embarrassing, and I think, oh my, what was I thinking, you know? Some of my feminist rants and stuff coming out of university, like, uh, too many women's courses, you know? And, no, but, um, which is a great program here, by the way, but um, I remember thinking, how embarrassing, or, you know, my early work is in the Excalibur and Now magazine, and I'm like, oh, but don't be, because it's you, you know? I'm taking a course, uh, I like to take creative writing courses through, um, another university, and uh, <laughs> no, I take them at U of T. They have a good writing program. They have a good one here too, but I live close to U of T, so I go there. And it's a creative writing course, and my professor is a, he's an author. He used to be a spy writer, you know. He, he's like this investigative reporter. Incredible, incredible um, career. And even he still gets self-doubt. And the first day I went to class, I said, I'm really embarrassed I'm writing these blogs or whatever, and I'm getting paid really well, but it's not content I love. And he said, don't ever put your work down. He said, don't ever. And uh, that's just stuck with me. And he said that to me a few weeks ago. So don't take it. I, I try, don't take any more down. <laughs> and just keep building on that and be proud of it. Because as a writer, you're going to have to defend the things that you write and say and research and think a lot. So it's good practice. I'd have to agree. I think you have to contextualize your writing sometimes, particularly as as you go on through the years and you still keep some of your better writing. If it's still available online, sometimes the companies go dark and yeah, it just you drowns can't out. find things. But if you have that's why I always try and take a PDF of, of a web page or an article or so that I still have a copy somewhere along the way uh, that I can reference or repost. That's where I talk about getting right to make sure you can repost things later in case things do disappear. To say I want the right to publish this for self-promotion on my website or personal site. Something to that effect if you're getting into contracts and stuff like that. That's pretty standard stuff. But if you have good writing but it's not the kind of writing you might do now, it's still a sample of your writing at the time. And if you do have a blog or a website, you can still post a link to it, but you can also post context to it or saying, I was looking at this thing I wrote five years ago, and boy, how much have I changed since that time. At the time, I was thinking this because this was going on, and this is why I wrote what this article here. Here's the link. Read it for yourself. Now, five years later, five years wiser in different circumstances, this is what I think about the same kind of issue. That shows growth and depth and maturity as a writer, but it also shows character. to people like me uh, your character, your state of mind from one time to another, but also shows how your writing evolves as well, but that you're also not afraid to uh, put your stuff out there, even if it's stuff that you might disagree with, but you're still proud of your writing because at the context of the time it was appropriate or, or poignant, but now it's just like, oh, maybe that's not quite what I would think now. That, that's okay. It's still, it's still cool. So long as, as, as the other folks are saying, it's not outright uh, slanderous, libelous, or offensive in some way. That's why you always got to try and be, put your professional hat on. Even if you're writing really fun, funky stuff, that's okay. Just be professionally fun and funky so that five, ten years down the road, it might seem a little quaint or goofy sometimes, but it's still, you can say, okay, back in the 80s, like when I started, I wrote stuff that was very 80-centric, some of the marketing material. Nowadays, you look at it, you couldn't use that material. Now it's, it's kind of, okay, some of that stuff doesn't get posted anymore, or, or it comes <laughs> out of my binder and into my archival binder and stuff like that. But it's your vintage still some binder, your vintage the binder. The vintage binder, and, and you do, I have a set of binders that sit side by side that would fill this table of all the copy I've ever done 
from flyers, magazines, wow. menu, uh, menus, articles, samples, technical writing. I couldn't do the technical writing because if I did that, it would basically go from that wall to the next on several levels because I've edited over 500 technical manuals. But I take sample pages from some of the best ones so that people can see the kind of work I've done over the years and, and how it's done through different technologies and different uh, streams of thought and presentation. And sometimes it's uh, screen captures because that's the way it's presented now. So. You don't want to obliterate your history, right? If no, the whole no, point no. is that you're trying to build a portfolio and build a, you know, a writing brand online or however, um, then you don't want to start deleting that or making excuses for what you wrote at the time because you don't ever want, even if you feel it inside, unless you're making a huge mistake, always say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Otherwise, stick to your guns. I mean, I can tell you to always be proud of everything you write, but if you are embarrassed of it, then make sure you have your five or six pieces you're, you're like. willing to send to anybody. <laughs> And because if you can feel that, you know, this article makes me sound biased and I'm applying for an editor's job, then have your five or six that you're proud to send to anybody. And uh, not to oppose you guys, but if you have something really bad online, take it down. I mean, <laughs> if, it, if you know it's bad, right, and use a pseudonym, that's a great idea. I do that when I want to write fun stuff and not prove <laughs> freedom. So. How far along are you expect? in your manuscript? Um, 53,000 words so far. So maybe and you've decided it's going to be 70? Is that how you know? Or? Um, I'm guessing okay. that's where I'm at, how far along. Uh, you're the publisher. <laughs> 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 no pressure. <laughs> I don't think I've ever, I don't think I've published that, that much in a year. Um, what would be the next step? Has anybody looked at it yet? Um, I Friends and family don't count. Yeah, <laughs> okay, well, you know, you might want to, uh, you know, get that sort of tight manuscript up, you know, the table of contents or anything like that, and, and have that ready, you know, to potentially go to some, uh, to some agents, some literary agents. Have you written your, your one line or your focus line or what the book is about? Like, do you, you know what I mean? What I'm asking is, um, I'm just having this conversation last night with someone. So um, basically, I think what, well, you, you're writing a book. Why don't you, why don't you say what, because I really. What, what you need is, is um, your pitch statement. It's like they do with movie scripts and that. It's mm -hmm. like uh, uh, Jaws meets uh, Harry Potter or something like that. Just something to start them off with, just to give them an idea of what kind of frame, their, frame of mind they should be in. Because if, they, if they're you know, dealing with a lot of romance fiction and you're writing a lot of science fiction, obviously you've got to watch which market you're doing. So you have to be careful. But that's, where you're, that's more the problem for, your, for your, the agent. Uh, you can't really do a table of contents with uh, the fiction book so much because they tend not to do that. It's not that it's never done, but it's rarely done. Like some of the larger fantasy novels might have some um, kind of thing like that. So you might want to come up with a very short see of what it is that's going on, a one page or no more than one page mm -hmm. summary of what's going on here. You know, you only have, it's like the elevator speech, you have maybe 30 seconds or a minute to convince something, somebody. And when I, when I teach the uh, students at the journals for the material we get in, not so much with poetry, but certainly with fiction and nonfiction, if you haven't grabbed me in the first 10 lines that I want to read a lot more, you, you haven't done your job as a writer to, to set the stage. Whether it's your novel or, or, or a, a, an essay or a work of fiction, so you have to grab people. If it's a precy that's telling you about the longer book, you have to captivate those people. Think of it as a movie trailer for your book. So what are you saying in those short lines? I even type out a movie trailer and just talk about, you know, they're usually, what, 90, 90 seconds long, maybe two, three minutes. Just sort of type one out that you thought was really cool that you said, I just have to see that movie. Said, well, pretend that's a book. Some books even have, mo have sort of movie trailers now. You I was just going to say, that's a new thing yeah. it's with a, It's authors. a new thing, and maybe you could even cook one up yourself with some, some friends. That might be one angle. Mm -hmm. That's adapting, adapting to new technologies and new realities. I think the one I've seen recently was Abe Lincoln Vampire Slayer or something like oh. that. And it just blew my mind. It's like, oh, no, what's going on? But it did capture my attention. Uh. I didn't necessarily want to read it, but it sure, sure stuck in my head, even now, that something as bizarre as that is... is 
is mm -hmm. possible. I mean, there, there's this, this whole cult genre that's going on right now, but um, you might want to type out the text of that, just so you can see roughly how long it is, and then do your own for your own book and say, if I had to make a, a quick trailer, this is the script I'd write for mm -hmm. it. And maybe you could even get somebody to act it out or something, just to see how it works. That if you're actually pitching it live, or get an acting student, if you're, or if you have an acting friend who's going to pitch it live as if it's, you know, their life depended on it, it was a multi-million dollar contract, said, I want them to publish this book, or I want to get this acting gig, you got to sell it to them. So figure out what's the best concept within it, and then, and then do that. First you, thing you still got to sell it to your agent. That's right. Mm -hmm. But first, finish the book. You know, focus on that. If you're 53, like, kudos to you, because that's hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's really tough. So if you believe in your, if you love your story, yeah. you love it. At the end, try to still love it, but unmarry it, because you're going to have to sell it. And you're going to have to not take things personally, because this is when publishers may turn you down. People might say, you know what? Like, if you're going to give it to an editor, and let's say that's just not their thing, you, know, you might have somebody read it. It's just not their genre, and they just don't get it. But if you really love your book, finish it at the end, divorce it, and then start chopping it around. You know, try um, agencies. But isn't there like just 30 literary agents or something in Canada? Like, there's not very many. There, there, there's quite a few. There's around. quite a few. Yeah. I or just I okay. I don't know about that world very much. I'm just getting into it myself. So, but just keep plugging away and try not to worry about all this because as a writer, like just producing the work, I think is probably the hardest stuff because you can you. That's when you can call upon your smart, savvy friends who are maybe really good into you know helping you come up with that pitch or that sell or giving you the confidence to shop it around. But then that's a whole other journey that you're going to be on. So just keep keep going. So a question about the page. Um, my story is basically it revolves around a big twist that they're not supposed to see coming. So should I add that in, or should it just kind of be like hmm. the stuff you put on the back of books? Uh, well, it's partly what you you would see the, the copy in the back of a book. They're not going to give away, you know, the resolution to it or the Twilight Zone twist or whatever is a really cool way that summarizes it. But you have to tease that it's there. Uh, you know. Stephen King does that with his books a lot. He said, you know, he goes through all this kind of stuff, and then, you know, something at the end completely bizarre happens. But they don't tell you that at the beginning of the book. They don't tell you at the end of the book. But you know through his reputation that it's coming, but you have to emulate that kind of thing. You have to sell them on the concept of the whole story with a, and you have to somehow sell the ending. You have to hint at what kind of an ending is going to happen, whether it's something completely unexpected, or, you know, you don't want to kill everybody off, or say everybody's going to die because nobody's going to want to read it. Uh, but you do have to say with a startling conclusion that will, you know, blow your mind or something. I'm not a copy writer for that kind of thing. But you have to look at some of the ones in the same genre you're, you're, you're interested in and see what they're writing on the back or see what kind of copy they're writing on the publisher site to help sell their books. Um, you might want to emulate those kinds of things and see what's going on, particularly for books you've read and say, okay, I know what's going on with the book. I know the story. I know how it finishes. Now I'm reading some of the copy material that's used to promote those books. That, okay, I see what they're saying to sell the book, but they're not giving away the story either. I mean, they're telling you what's going on, but they're not say, they're not ruining it for you, right? They're not telegraphing the end. Okay. Thank you. Can you go um, on to continue on the question of him? Because we're the first writer, how we protect our intestinal property. For instance, like you can show your agent, and your agent to sell the uh, movie filmmaker, they get stealing your idea, and they make a film, and you have so the question is, how, how do you prevent it? someone from stealing? Yes. If, you've, if you've presented your manuscript to a literary agent or whoever, mm -hmm. how do you prevent no, somebody from stealing you your, your work? Lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't worry about it at all, yeah. to be honest, because um, like I take a lot of screenwriting classes, and I've studied under professional screenwriters, and they always say that's kind of the sign of an amateur is when you're afraid to tell people your idea. I agree. Because, I um, agree. The chances of someone actually stealing your idea is very low. And going all the way with it. And if they went all the way with it, then they deserved it. Because <laughs> they went all the way with it. You know what I mean? But uh, where stuff can get stolen is like editors steal all the time. You know, like don't get scared. Still pitch. But there's always ways to do that. Just put it at the top of your uh, manuscript, strictly confidential. Like just let people know what you, that you mean business. And then get lawyers involved when, you know, the time comes. When copywriters send me stuff, like if they don't want me to, you know, like take it or, you know, if they're, if they're concerned, I always just say I'll sign off on anything. I don't, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, yeah. Anybody who's not planning on stealing your stuff will have no problems signing anything like that. 
keep meticulous records of your communications, whether you're communicating by email or you're, you're using telephone or old school. Keep a log of who you're talking to and when and what about, uh, because uh, that I've never had to have fall back on that, but I do know people who have had to fall back on their records uh, when issues of rights or communications or payments were made. It's, mm -hmm. it's all just good business practice is just to keep a, it's almost, it's like having a blog for yourself, yeah. right, of just who you're talking to, when and what about, and that, and when was last. It's also good networking practice because then that allows you to say, okay, the last time I talked to Jeff was three months ago about this. Maybe it's time to, to, to ping him again and see what, whether he's still interested in this particular project. So th that will help you out, sure. We've had a few people with a hands up for a long time, so we'll start with you. Um, I just want to know how can someone go about looking for a literary agent? Where do I, you know, do I just type it into Google? Like, where is, where yep. do I find these people? Start How literary. Find a literary agent. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Just Google up literary agents Toronto. And just literary do groundwork. Mm -hmm. Call. Uh, they usually say right on their site sometimes that they're accepting, not accepting manuscript. There's also independent publishers. You know, there's the big ones like the big houses like Random House and Penguin and stuff. But you can also go to the smaller guys. It just depends what your end goal is. If you just want a thousand people to read your book, then you know you could probably self-publish and distribute and sell a thousand books yourself if you really hustle. But if you want major spread and you want something bigger and you really want to get pulled into the whole publishing world, then Google Google those publishers and start knocking on doors. There's one here sitting next to you. <laughs> um, gentleman in the brown jacket. Uh, um, on that note, um, I think there's, I've heard a lot of kind of um, speculation over the last few years that editors are dying, especially when it comes to uh, literature. That nowadays, if you're a literary writer, you also have to be your own editor. Um, you have to have an eye out for typos, and you have to have, be, have a good eye for substantive editing, not like 50 years ago, where some sort of postmodern mm -hmm. avant-garde author would be able to kind of have an editor there to hold his hand or her yeah. hand throughout the entire writing process. Um, so to what extent, I understand, Adrian, uh, you publish at Lombard, do you I get the general idea you do a lot of um, technical uh, business and economics or? What we do is, is like financial uh, investment advice and natural health advice. Mm -hmm. And I have two full-time editors for a team of eight full-time writers. Okay. Um, do you have any idea of what, what the market's like or what the climate's like for people who want to do editing, but on a literary or a humanities thing, so to be an editor uh, for history or for uh, political science or so on? I, in all honesty, I don't. I don't have, like, I'm not a part of that industry, so I, I don't, but, you know. I might be able to um, answer that a little bit. When you say uh, literary, are you talking, like, writing for the walrus, or are you talking about writing uh, not heavier? Not writing, but editing. But so editing for a periodical or for, like, like a magazine or... Uh, be attractive to me, but I'm also thinking more about a book length. So, like mm. being an editor of um, uh, sort of some 500 page Marxist tome or something, or right. um, <laughs> maybe uh, like an experimental novel or whatever, or to be, or even like not even something that uh, 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 contrarian, but like a, something maybe even just any sort of literary novel. I know a something. guy that's got 53,000 words written already. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> But, but I mean, like, I, know, uh, I think that's, that's a great a idea, actually. Where I'll be able to kind of uh, eat and pay rent. <laughs> oh. Oh, and that, and that. I mean, like, I Does your mom cook really well? <laughs> no, but um, I can make my own bread and eat apples and live on that. Yeah. Apples, and, you know. So your question is: Is is there a like are there job uh, opportunities for editors, particularly in the areas of humanities and literature or that kind of? I, I think there is, there are, there definitely are jobs, okay, in that, um, but uh, there's a um, really interesting writer um, who, I, I was reading some of her stuff recently, and she said, there's no, th there's no such thing as the, the child prodigy writer, and she's like, it's very much a grown-up thing to do, and the reason I say that is because I'm 31, and um, I still feel really young in this business, and it's not to say that anyone in here is young, I'm just telling you that it's a, Writing and publishing is a long road. It's not, there's not immediate satisfaction, you know? So there is work a, a for that, but you may not, let's say, get that right out of school, right out of the gate. But maybe you could be an editor for, 
you know, a smaller magazine downtown. Like, you still need to know how to figure out how to be an editor, you know, and, and what comes with that. And then I think as you go along, those opportunities to edit those really cool projects will come, whether it's from an independent writer or from a larger publishing house that publishes really big periodicals and they need a really solid editor on it. So there are opportunities there. You, you did mention that, like, 50 years ago, writers didn't have to be as poignant. I don't know if that's true or not, but I definitely feel there's a lot of pressure on writers to be good at everything today. And be careful, you know, like be a good writer and practice or do your editing, yeah. but bless you. But as a professional, yeah. your stuff should be on par. You know, like there are people who get nervous emailing me because they're like, I don't want any spelling mistakes. My emails are loaded with that stuff. But when it comes down to it, you know, make sure that you're always um, putting your best foot forward and the opportunities will come. Sorry, you had another question? Well, oh no, just an observation that like, 50 years ago, I mean, uh, Thomas Pynchon, Joseph yeah. Heller, Catch-22, and uh, yeah. William Gaddis, who wrote yeah. the recognitions of JR, all had the same uh, editors, same agents. Right. Um, and those people actually went to bat for them consistently. They, uh, I know for Catch-22, it was exhaustively edited and kind of cut down by this person. I can't remember the name for life of me, but um, it seems like that, that type of very active role was attractive to me. Mm -hmm. um, and that they were able to make a living on that. It's not like they had to kind of do, you know, uh, the day job at law firms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that takes that just takes time, and also the industry is just totally different. So yeah. it's not that editors are dying. Cause people say print is dying, and it's not. It's just shifting. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's not going to die. Just like editors won't die, but their need will be much different. And the other thing is, editors need to be really good writers. And I find that more and more. Like I've worked with editors who are really terrible writers, and it shows. So. Edward, do you want to make a comment? Yeah, there, there's. The industry has transitioned a lot. A lot of the editors that were, I guess you'd say, stock editors or stable editors that were part of the, the publishing house permanent staff, that has shrunk and they've moved, to, like a lot of industries, to contract labor. Uh, so do be aware of that, but that means you might have more opportunities to diversify your skill set. If you, strict, if you keep yourself strictly to literary pursuits, you're limiting yourself. I mean, if that's your goal, you want to be 20 years from now, that's fine. But don't turn down the other stuff just because, yeah. you know, you, you, it, it's all credit to your skill set. It's all credit to the diversification of your, of your skill set portfolio, your adaptability to suit different uh, publishers, different authors, uh, and different opportunities because that will change. E-publishing is creating a new paradigm again. Uh, now that we have e-readers become very accepted, we have I, iPads and, and other kinds of tablets. There's new publishing domains there. Books are transitioning into not just text, but text with soundtracks, uh, audio pictures, interactive things, sort of semi website y but you, you, know, you can pop up different kinds of things. So that might be an area where you can uh, take existing texts and give them new life by adding new levels of interactivity to it or dimensions or referencing or those kinds of things because the technology has changed the way the information is presented. If you can start jumping on the front of that curve, then you can start making your own game and be making yourself indispensable. And that's where the real trick is, to make yourself indispensable to the people you're doing by, one, delivering everything you said you're going to deliver on time and on budget. Mm -hmm. Never, 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 never fail on doing that because that's the fastest way to get yourself out of the business or at least to damage your reputation. It's very hard to get that back. It takes a lot of work. So always, always, always be on time and be on budget. If the budget goes out, out, better not be your fault, it better be somebody else's fault because they've changed the dynamics. But you better change your, make sure your contract says that you know if there's unforeseen circumstances or they change what's to be deliver, delivered, you know, the, you know, the publisher says, okay, I actually want to change the book you know, to something else and re rework it. Okay, that's cost plus because that's not what we agreed on initially. Better get that stuff in writing. But I think you can make a uh, decent living as an editor, but you have to make yourself indispensable and highly adaptable. And then once you start getting that portfolio and making your connections and building that network, you can start concentrating and building your reputation that you're a specialist in this, that, or the other thing. But that you can also do the others in a pinch if need be. I, I realize uh, there's still many questions, and um, I'm going to bring our formal Q&A session to a close now, but you will have a, an opportunity to ask your questions in a few minutes. Um, so our intention today, um, for today's session really was to um, provide you with an opportunity to learn more about some career um, possibilities within the field of writing and publishing, um, and to um, 
to gain insight on what are some things that you can um, do to get started um, in, in the, um, your career field. Um, so I want to thank our panelists for coming and speaking and sharing their great okay. insights and ideas and experiences <laughs> um, and advice with all of us, um, Adrian Noonan, Sandy Braz, Eric Tyndale, and uh, Edward Fenner.